Good morning. At this time, stand with us as we open in song. Indeed we do. We set our hope on Jesus Christ, and we set our hope on him. He is a sure foundation. He does not disappoint. He's our hope for salvation. He's our hope for peace and joy and life. He's our hope for eternity. So I hope you know him and trusting in him today, for he is a sure foundation that we rest upon. We've talk, been talking about that Christianity is evidence-based, and our faith is not Standing on nothing on thin airs. It's, it's on a sure foundation of Jesus Christ and who he is. I hope you know him today. We're glad you're here. If you haven't already filled out the information card that is in your bulletin, take it out at some point in the service. Fill it out. And then when you leave, place it in the offering drop boxes that are at the back of the sanctuary. 
Let me leave us in prayer this morning as we focus upon who God is and our desire to worship him today. Let us pray. Oh, Father God, we do come this morning setting our focus upon you, knowing that you love us, you want us to know you, and you've given so many evidences that you're real, even that you're here today. And so we come tuning our minds and our hearts to you, seeking to hear as you speak, but most of all, seeking to worship you today because you're worthy of our worship and our praise for being God, and not just for being God, but also for all that you do, your mercy, your grace, your salvation that you give. We come, Father, recognizing our need for you, our frailties, our weaknesses, as men and women and boys and girls, but also acknowledging that you're our sufficiency, you're our salvation, you're our cleansing, you're our hope. And we know, Father, we live in a world that is trying to live without hope. And so we who know you, may we carry your light and your truth every day into a world that so desperately needs you. So we pray for our world. We pray for spiritual revival, awakening in our land. We pray for our our leaders, our president, for those in authority, Father God, that the Spirit of God would come upon them and they would lead according to your ways and your truth and according to your holy righteousness. We need you, Father, in all times. We need you today. So we thank you for your presence, and I thank you for each one here as we come seeking truth but come to worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship him together this morning.
allowing us to be here this morning. I thank you for Brother Hal bringing the message. I pray that you'll just open our hearts and minds to hear from you and just help us this day and this week to live for you in everything that we do. Thank you for your creation. We thank you for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated.
where we are in a series of messages entitled Christianity is evidence-based and this morning we're looking at the subject of creationism is evidence-based and I want you to turn in your Bible to Romans chapter 1 Romans chapter 1 is the focus of our study this Sunday and next Sunday particularly in Romans chapter 1 and Romans chapter 1 is it's so important, I mean, of course it's God's word, but for many reasons, but it explains a lot about our world today. It explains a lot about the way people act, the way people try to explain the obvious, try to, how do they, they try to explain it away, and why that is. So Romans chapter 1, take also your sermon insert. There's a pretty good bit of space between each point because there are a few things you may want to uh, jot down. But our focus is in Romans chapter 1. I want to begin reading in verse 18 where the scripture says this. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. For although they know God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Yesterday I was driving... And I looked at the car in front of me, and I noticed it had several bumper stickers on the car, not just on the bumper, but posted all over the back. And one of the bumper stickers said, Science is real. Now, because all the other bumper stickers uh, that said various things on the car, I had a pretty good idea where they were going with the science is real thing. Christians, we believe in real science. We just don't like to believe in false sounds and pseudo sounds and things that are made to be sounds that not really are. You know, in 1 Timothy 6, I think it's in about verse 20, several weeks ago we talked about it where the passage says, be aware, be on the alert for things that are raised against God in Christianity that are called science but really are not. You know, we looked at that word and said it's pseudoscience, it's make-believe science. It's not real science, but yet people call it science. There are things in our world that are raised up. They're called science in opposition to the things of God, but it's really not science at all. You know, atheists and evolutionists uh, often like to think of themselves as being very intelligent or rational or scientific, and they like to call Christians foolish or being unscientific for the things that they believe and the things that they say are true. And in fact, the Bible says it will be like this. The Bible says that the unbelieving world will make fun of Christians and they will say that uh, Christians are not scientific and they are intelligent. They themselves, the atheists or the evolutionists, that they're intelligent and, and they're being scientific. And our passage here in Romans says that when people reject God, when people leave God out, then they become foolish in their thinking. And their, their thinking is darkened so that they come up with crazy ideas and we see examples of that in many ways around us how people come up with crazy ideas about you know, life and how you live and how you relate to others and about creation itself. And that when a person rejects God and their thinking becomes distorted, that they will become trying to give the appearance of being scientific or intelligent. 
And this passage says they will come up of all ways of trying to appear intelligent and thinking, but in reality that they're just fools. And so if you believe the Bible and you believe in God and what it says about how things are, then the world looks foolish to you, right? If you believe the Bible and what God says, then the world looks foolish to you in the things that it says. And if you are following the world and the ways of the world, then the Bible, Christianity, and God looks foolish to you. And we see that in our world so many times that Christians look at the world and say, how can they believe that? How can they do that? And the world looks at Christians and say, how can Christians really believe that? So if you are a Christian, the world looks foolish to you. If you are of the world and an unbeliever or don't believe in God, then Christianity, the Bible, and God look foolish to you. And here's the kicker. You get to decide who you look foolish to. Whether you look foolish to the world or whether you look foolish to God. Right? If you follow the world, you're going to look foolish to God. If you follow the Bible, you're going to look foolish to the world. So you and I get to decide who we look foolish to. So I put Psalm 14, verse 1 on your outline. It says, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. The fool. You want to know what a fool is? It's not according to me, it's according to God. The fool has said, There is no God. When you leave God out of creation of our world, it's foolish. Why? The Bible says it is so obvious that there's a creator that nobody can say, I had no way of no knowing. The evidence is so great, nobody can say, well, I didn't know. You know, there are six areas that an atheist or an evolutionist cannot adequately explain about our creation, about our universe. In all of their intelligence and science, they cannot explain certain things about our world. Uh, some have called this the six miracles that atheists believe without a miracle worker. An atheist can't believe in a miracle worker because they don't believe in God. And a miracle is something, as we talked about several weeks ago, that occurs through the supernatural intervention of God. And many people, many Christians, have written about these six miracles that atheists believe in but they don't believe in a miracle worker some others have called these uh, six uh, magic tricks without a magician some people have called them six superstitions of atheists the atheists generally say that Christians are the one that are superstitious but but atheists believe in some incredible things about our creation that would have to be superstitious other people call them fairy tales Christians are often accused of believing in fairy tales. But it's actually the atheists, the evolutionists, that believe in fairy tales. Whatever you call them, whether you call them six miracles that atheists believe or six superstitions or six fairy tales, the Bible says they are foolish. It is foolish to not believe in God. It is foolish not to believe that there's a creator that created all that we see in some of the stuff, sampling of it in the video. So what are these things? We're going to talk about them. Like I said, there are diff different people have written about them in, in different ways. But we're going to talk about six things that a, an atheist or a person who believes in evolution believes and how really foolish they are. The first one on your outline, the belief that everything comes from nothing. The belief that everything comes from nothing. This is talking about the origin of the universe. Where did the universe come from? Atheists and evolutionists believe that everything we see in our world around us came from nothing. If you put it in an equation, it would be nothing plus time plus chance equals everything. And that, of course, sounds so foolish. It is a miracle you know, without a miracle worker that everything could come from nothing. Almost every scientist today, Christian or non-Christian, would say our universe had a beginning. And if something has a beginning, it has to have a cause for the beginning. But 
the evolutionist and the uh, um, atheist have a hard time coming up with what is the beginning of our universe. Sometimes you'll hear people say, and you've probably heard it a lot, that at some point there was this densely compacted spot or dot, or different ones will say it was different size, but this densely compacted mass of gases. And it exploded. It was a big bang. And the contents of that mass of gases were hurled out at over the speed of light, scattering out into the distance. But somehow they slowed down or attracted one another and they came together to form the stars and, and all that is, and things came from that. You know, you know, and as you think about it, you think, is that possible? Well, where did it come from? Where did that densely packed mass of gases come from and what caused it to, to go bang, you know? Our world consists of time and space and matter. If these things evolved, which evolved first? If matter evolved first, but there was no space, where would it be? If there were matter and space, but there were no time, when would it be? These things could not have just magically happened. Certainly they could have evolved one before the other. Time and space and matter had to come into existence at the exact same moment. And how did that happen? Well, the Bible explains it in the first verse. The very first verse of the Bible says in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, that's when, God, that's the cause, created, that's how, the heavens, that's space, and the earth, that's matter. See, if you can accept Genesis 1-1, you won't have a problem with any of the rest of the Bible because God is the cause. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth. Well, then some people say, well, where did God come from? You say, well, everything you know, had a beginning. Our universe had a beginning. Where did God come from? How did he begin? Well, according to the Bible, the God of the Bible is over and above and outside time, space, and matter. He's eternal. He's described as eternal in the Bible. So he's outside of time. He is not spatial. He's not matter. The Bible says that God is spirit. So God is over and above and outside of time, space, and matter. So he had no beginning. He's always existed. So the atheist or the evolutionist that leaves God out of our world struggles with an adequate explanation for how the universe came into being except everything came from nothing. And you, they say, well, you say, well, how can that be? And you say, well, it has to be you know, that it came from nothing because the universe is here today. It can't be God because God doesn't exist. And so everything has to come from nothing. We, but the problem is we see no example in our world today. You know, a lot of science goes on testing things and, and observing things. There's no example in our world of things coming from nothing, from nothing, or things coming with, out of cause. And so it's not very scientific. In fact, the Bible says it's foolish to believe that our universe got here from nothing. And then the second thing that atheists and evolutionists believe that are fairy tales or miracles without a miracle worker is that the belief that life comes from non-life. Life comes from non-life. This is talking about the origin of life. The previous belief of atheists is talking about the origin of the universe. How did the matter get here, the time or the, the space get here? But here we're talking about life. Where did life come from? Did life just magically appear from nothing? Does life come from non-life? Does life come from just a matter or gas? You know, that's the stuff fairy tales are made of, that life just appears from nothing. It is a belief that is portrayed to be scientific, you know, or intellectual, but it's really 
crazy. Life is a complex thing. There are various components made up in life. There are proteins, there are enzymes that go into making of life. How does life develop even from the proteins and the enzymes and the other things that are necessary for life just by chance or just by luck or from nothing, even if you throw in however many millions of years you want to throw in? The Bible says it's foolishness. The Bible doesn't teach things like that. The Bible doesn't teach that life just comes from nothing or that life comes from non-life or that it just happens by chance. The Bible teaches that life comes from life and not just any life. It comes from the author of life who is life. Look on your outline at John chapter 1, verse 4. It says, in him, it's talking about Christ. It says, in him was life. And that life was the light of of all mankind very important in him was life and he was in the beginning God in him was life and that life was the light of every mankind and in Genesis 2 verse 7 Genesis 2 verse 7 then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground by the way if you looked at the elements in man that make up our body, they're, they're elements of the dust. They're element, elements of the ground. He formed man out of the uh, dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So how did man become a living being? Was it by chance or coming from non-life or, or coming uh, from nothing? No. It says we got life from the source of life. Jesus Christ, God, is life. And then Colossians 1, Colossians 1 talks about how life holds together, how life can be, but how it continues to exist. Colossians 1, 16, and verse 17 we saw on the screen before one of the songs, for in Christ all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, where the thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is that which holds all things together. So there was a time when people thought that life happened just by what some people call spontaneous generation, that it, it came from non-life, and that was pretty popular thinking. For example, if you saw some roadkill on the side of the road and it was dead, no life there, it was just a dead animal, you know, around here we call it a possum or an armadillo or whatever, it was just a piece of dead something there, you look at it, and, you know, it's just dead. Then a few days later you come back, and it's moving. Not the, not the body of it, but things in it are moving. Little wormy things. And you say, well, there's obvious life there. Where did that life come from? Well, it came from that dead thing. It came from that non-life. Or if you had a piece of bread and you sat it on the counter, and you know, bread is, doesn't have life, it's just there. But then a few days later, this green stuff appeared, and it started growing, and it started spreading, and you would see that, you know, this is life. And so people concluded that life just spontaneously happens, and that's how it must have happened in the beginning, that it just happened. It came from non-life, or it came from something that was nothing even. But then more advances occurred with microscopes and biochemistry and Christian scientists like Louis Pasteur uh, proved and showed that spontaneous generation doesn't happen. It was impossible that life does not come from non-life. Life always comes from life. So what do scientists and, and atheists do to explain the origin of life? Well, they say it had to happen at some time to where it came from nothing because we're here we have life and so at some point it had to come into existence or come together but it can't be because of God because we don't believe in God see the problem we talked about sci scientists thoughts and the limitations of science several weeks ago we said that where there are biases in science it can skew the results 
And when somebody says there is no God, then they have to invent ways to appear scientific or intelligent because their foolish mind starts to take over. And they start making conclusions about things that are simply foolish. So when somebody says, well, we know life must have come from nothing or by chance because there's no God. By the way, some people are now saying you know, that it came from uh, moon, uh, stardust, that that's where life came from. That's how we got life on Earth, that there was life in the stardust that came to Earth and that generated life. But where did that come from? <laughs> You know, where did that life come from? So it's just a, a practice in fairy tales and futility. They believe that life comes from non-life. The Bible doesn't teach that. And then number three on your outline, the next thing that it's really a miracle without a miracle work or fairy tale is that the belief that information and intelligence evolved from the physical and by chance that information and intelligence evolved from the physical and by chance. As we think about this, every living organism has a very detailed and very designed information and coding system within its DNA. This coding system is like a detailed information instruction manual. You know, like our cars or any other piece of machinery will have a, an instruction manual with a lot of details written in several different languages, you know. We can only read one, or some, most of us can only read one, but it's written in several different languages, and it's an instruction manual in details for how that thing is to operate. And living organisms have this very detailed instruction information manual that tells the organism, everything about it, how it's to function all the way down to each individual cell. Within a human body, this information coding system instructs details like our hair color, our eye color, our skin pigment, uh, tones and regulations, even in our voices, how we perceive things with the eye, and how we take those things in, how our body functions like in breathing and blood, workings of blood and digestion and detail after detail after detail of our bodies is in this information instruction coding system within our bodies. I heard someone explain it. It's like, you know, reading a language. You know, our language, like the print on your outline, is made up of letters. You know, our, our alphabet has 26 letters. But if you just threw the letters on the page, it wouldn't make any sense. It would just be gobbledygook. And it wouldn't lead to any understanding or any application. Or if they were, you know, telling what to do, you wouldn't know anything to do or how to do it because they were just letters thrown in a page. Those letters have to be organized into words that make sense, and the words have to be organized into sentence structure, and the sentences must be organized into paragraphs and into chapters and into books, and that provides understanding. And as I read that organized and that uh, designed construction of the alphabet, it makes sense. Well, in a sm very small way, that's how our bodies function. There is this detailed coding system of information and instruction in every cell of our body, in our DNA, that gives instructions on how it is to function. Where did it come from? Where did that information, that instruction, come from? Did it just come from the physical? That, can it come from non-intelligence can it come from a gas or a rock a computer works because there's a computer designer who wired it in a certain way and programmed a uh, program that computer to function and to do the work that it was supposed to do you don't think well the computer you know was just a pile of screws and metals and somehow or another it came together by chance and in, in millions of millions of years into a computer and then somehow it developed within itself by chance and luck in millions of years a program so that it could function as a computer you say that would be foolish that would be a miracle but no God to do it or no computer designer to do it. It would be a, just a fairy tale. A computer works because it has 
a computer designer and a programmer that puts it together. And we as humans have a intelligent mind that has put us together in detail after detail after detail in our coding system of instruction and information. And it's not only that. Not only do we have this instruction coding system within our DNA that tells us how to read it, there's also the ability within our bodies in our coding to read that coding system. You know, it's one thing to have a bunch of words on a piece of paper like your outline, but if you can't read English, it doesn't help to have it there in English, does it? You know, if it was there in Mandarin or Chinese or whatever, I couldn't read it because I don't understand it. But our bodies have been designed in such a way that there's not only a coding information instruction system within our bodies, but we also have the decoding system within our bodies so that our bodies can take that instruction and apply it to the use of our bodies. It's incredible. And the more you look at it, the more it blows your mind about how detailed and how intelligent it is. It just happened by chance. But not only do we have the information instruction coding system, we as humans have intelligence. We have the ability to think rationally. We have freedom of choice. Where did those elements of our being come from? Where did intelligence or the, the, the ability to think rationally to come from? Where does freedom of will come from? Does that just come from nothing? That, that, that just by chance developed? I mean, that's foolishness. Or even to think it came from non-intelligence, to think that intelligence can come from non-intelligence, that free will or rational thought can come from a gas or a rock. Throw in however many billions of years you want to throw in. It, it makes no sense. See, Christianity doesn't teach this. Christianity does not teach that intelligence comes from nothing or that intelligence comes from non-intelligence. Christianity teaches that intelligence comes from the all-wise, the all-sovereign all God. Look at on your outline. There are a lot of verses I could have put, but I put just two. Proverbs 2, verse 6. It says, For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge. And understanding right there it says that there's a source of intelligence by which mankind are to function and it is God it is sovereign Lord it is the all-wise God the Creator God and then look in in Daniel chapter 5 Daniel in Daniel remember um, the Babylonians have have taken uh, they've invaded Jerusalem they've taken some of the Jews back uh, to Babylon uh, Belshazzar at this point is the king of Babylon, I believe, and uh, he, he has a dream and he, and he wants uh, it interpreted. So he calls in some of his wise people and they can't really in interpret the dream. And so he's heard about Daniel. He's heard that Daniel is an amazing person. He has a wisdom, an understanding of things that just the people he knows in his group uh, doesn't have. And Belshazzar calls Daniel in, and although Belshazzar doesn't understand everything about God, the God, he believes that there's supernatural and that there is a source of wisdom and knowledge beyond just the physical. And so in Daniel 5, verse 14, he says, this is Belshazzar speaking to Daniel, I've heard that the spirit of the gods, he thinks there's gods, and you know, he, he knows it's a spiritual thing, but he says, I've heard that the spirit of the gods is on you, and that you have insight, intelligence, and outstanding wisdom. See, even this pagan unbeliever knew in his mind that had been given to him by God, that source of wisdom and knowledge and understanding is not just something that comes from non-intelligence, but it, it has to come from the supernatural. It has to come from God. And yet we're told that the intelligence, the wisdom, 
freedom of choice is something that evolved in mankind over thousands of thousands and thousands of years. And that in the evolution of things, when man evolved from some lower life forms, that they were just dummies because their intelligence hadn't developed to where they were smarties. <laughs> they were just dummies. But when you read the Bible, you don't see that. You see that life came from life, came from God, and intelligence and wisdom came from intelligence, comes from God. So in the Bible, when you read about Adam, the first man that the Bible tells us of, he wasn't a dummy. I mean, in Genesis, it tells us that all the animals came before him and he named them. Try that. You know, who knows what we'd come up with. But all the animals, he named them all. He, was, he was, had intelligence because it came from God. And, and we really know he had intelligence and wisdom because when God made Eve and Eve stood before him, he said, translating the Hebrew into English, wow. That's what he said. He recognized the woman was like nothing else he'd ever seen. He said, this is perfect for me. He had intelligence. He had wisdom. Think about Noah. Was Noah a dummy in the Bible? I mean, he built the ark under the inspiration of God, under the guidance of God. I mean, think about the engineering feat of the ark. You know, he wasn't a dummy. He was a man that had intelligence and wisdom of God because God is the source. And our wisdom our knowledge and wisdom is knowing right and doing right. A lot of people don't use wisdom because they reject the knowledge of God and they come up with foolishness. But then many people don't use the, their intelligence correctly or even develop their intelligence. And the Bible says why that is. It's because the foolishness of rejecting God and doing things without him. I want to read um, a portion of Job, just from Job 38. You don't have to turn, I'd rather you just listen to the, um, the magnitude of this passage. Remember in Job, a lot of things have happened, but some things have happened to Job and his family that Job did not understand. Some tragedies, some problems Job was struggling with how you put this all together. And then he had some so-called pals and buddies that were you know, trying to explain things kind of in a worldly sense to Job. And so Job brought some of these questions and doubts he had before God. And it came a point where God said, Job, just listen. Just, just listen. Let me talk to you. And so just listen right now as I read Job 38 as we think about creation and the sovereignty of God and how foolish it is to believe that all creation and ourselves and our life came from nothing just by, by chance. Job chapter 38. Then the Lord answered Job out of the storm. He said, Who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. Who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness, when I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place, when I said, this far you may come and no further, 
how is where your proud waves halt? Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place that it might take the earth by the edges and shake the wicked out of it? The earth takes shape like clay under a seal. Its features stand out like those of a garment. The wicked are denied their light, and their upraised arm is broken. Have you journeyed to the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of the shadow of death? Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me if you know this. What is the way of the abode of life? And where does darkness reside? Can you take them to their places? Do you know the paths to their dwellings? Surely you know, for you are already born. You have lived so many years. God's a little sarcastic, isn't he? Have you entered the storehouses of the snow? Or seen the storehouses of the hell, which I reserve for times of trouble, for days of war and battle? What is the way to the place where the lightning is dispersed? Or the place where the east winds are scattered over the earth? Who cuts a channel for the torrents of rain? Or a path for the thunderstorm? to water a land where no man lives, a desert with no one in it, to satisfy a desolate wasteland and make it sprout with grass. Does the rain have a father who fathers the drops of dew? From whose womb comes the ice? Who gives birth to the frost? From the heavens, when the waters become hard as stone, when the surface of the deep is frozen. Can you bind the beautiful Pleiades? Can you loose the cords of Orion? Can you bring forth the constellations in their seasons or lead out the bear with its cubs? Do you know the laws of the heavens? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? Can you raise your voice to the clouds and cover yourself with a flood of water? Do you send the lightning bolts on their way? Do they report to you? Here we are. Who endued the heart with wisdom or gave understanding to the mind? Who has the wisdom to count the clouds? Who can tip over the water jugs of the heavens? When the dust becomes hard and the clods of the earth stick together, do you hunt the prey for the loudness and satisfy the hunger of the lions? When they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in a thicket, who provides food for the raven? When its youngs cry out to God and wander about for lack of food. Who created all these things? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Would you bow your heads this morning? If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Bible says the evidence is all around us that God's real. The evidence says that God is real, that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross, and that by believing in him, by trusting in him, you shall have everlasting life. The Bible says that no one can say, I had no way of knowing, but it's in the hardness of heart that people reject God and the salvation that he's offered. But in the, the working of God, that which is hard, is softened, and a person 
believes upon Jesus? Do you believe upon Jesus? You want to live for him as your Lord, your Savior. Father God, I thank you that you do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. You bring us life. You've given us physical life, but most importantly, you give us life in Christ, spiritual life. And I pray for some today. I pray for some that are listening online that have believed the lies of the world, that there is no God, that we're all just here by accident. There's no eternity. Father, we know your word is true, and we know the evidence is all around us, that there is a God, a God who wants us to know you. And by the moving of your spirit and the speaking of your word, you allow us to believe. And so I pray that people would believe today and commit their life to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have a decision this morning concerning your relationship and commitment to Jesus Christ, we encourage you to make it, whether you're here, whether you're online. Make it public, because he calls us not to be ashamed of the gospel, but to publicly proclaim that he is our Lord and Savior. So we encourage you to do that. Stand with me as we sing. Glad you're here this morning. Be back next Sunday. We're going to talk about those three more things that atheists believe that are just crazy about creation and us and how we got here. As you know, summer is not a slow time for us here at the church. We've had our youth go off on a retreat. We have our kids just got back. We have uh, vacation Bible school coming up, and we've been very busily working. If you want to get your kids, your grandkids signed up for that, there'll be someone in the Welcome Center, and if they want to order T-shirts, they need to go ahead and get those, or the music, they can get those. Uh, so that's available out in the Welcome Center in the foyer. Also, just letting you know, because 4th of July is very quick, on July the 3rd, which is Wednesday night, our children is part of our children in the ministry, but really it's a church-wide thing and a community-wide thing. We're going to have um, some hot dogs because you've got to have hot dogs around the 4th of July. And we're having a movie particularly designed for our kids, so it'll be kids-friendly. And then we're going to have a fireworks show. And if you haven't been to one of our fireworks show, people come to it and go, wow, that's a great fireworks show. And so we'll be outside, so bring your lawn chair. But we'll have our regular Wednesday night service on that July the 3rd, and then that night afterwards, particularly as it gets dark, we'll be having the activity. So be making plans for that, and I think you'll enjoy it. So good to see you. Look forward to seeing you Wednesday night. Uh, thank you for all being here. Let's sing our closing song. Thank you, you artist.